today's webinar is going to be about uh, empowered OER and how to create and find inclusive OER. And we've got a guest from all the way from the United States, Tanya Gross, uh, and I've calculated that there's 15,000 kilometers between Tanya and Ash from Uni of SA today. So it's really fantastic to have that global um, aspect. Um, so for those of you who haven't encountered this uh, group before, we're part of Ascolite, uh, and we're a special interest group focused on open educational practices. Uh, we meet every month to connect practitioners with each other and talk about our um, what we're all up to. Um, and this webinar series is part of this group. We do one webinar every month on a different theme. We also have a great team who put together a monthly newsletter called the OEP Digest. Um, it does have an Australasian focus, uh, though we do have a lot of US uh, news in that as well. And if you want to receive that monthly digest on the latest open educational news, you can sign up on our website, um, which is on the slide at the moment, and you'll get an email every time that comes out. This is a artwork by the Wurundjeri artist Judy Nicholson um, of Bunjil, and I just want to acknowledge that our webinar is happening on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I want to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders past and present and Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be here today. And acknowledge that this is unceded land as long as no treaty is signed. So today we're very lucky to have uh, Tanya and Ash. And just for a little bit of context, how this came together, I guess uh, Tanya connected with um, our group through a partnership between the Open Education Network in the US, which is, has been a major force in, in transformation in, in, uh, in America with the Open Educational Resources Advocacy. Um, and they've had so many inspiring wins and managed to get, you know, campaign and advocate and get millions of dollars of funding from governments there, which has really inspired us here. Um, and connected with our OEPC, OEPC community via um, Uni of SQ's Adrian Stagg. So, yeah, that's been a great partnership. And also want to mention that today has also been made possible by the libraries of the Australian Technology Network, Latin, who funded the fellowship that Ash used to do a study trip, go, go over to the United States and has come back with all this wonderful knowledge to share today. So yeah, Ash is an academic librarian from Uni of South Australia, and she's really passionate about lifelong learning and innovative educational experiences, um, putting together digital technologies and learning and teaching. She's got experience in copyright, acquisitions, licensing, online curriculum support, um, and is passionate about a holistic approach to open educational practices. She's also very involved in the Call OER Collective, um, is a champion there. And yeah, what made this all possible was her winning a fellowship through Latin, which enabled her to do this project on inclusive solutions in OER. Tanya Gross is, yeah, the director of the Open Educational Network, and um, she's in St. Paul, USA, which is near, was it Min Minneapolis, Tanya? <laughs> yep, great. And yeah, as the dean at University of Northwestern St. Paul, she led an open textbook initiative, which led to the creation of the first zero zero cost degree in the state of Minnesota. So that's fantastic. And um, yeah, look, I think the most important thing about her is she lives in St. Paul with her husband and two schnauzers, and they have uh, two daughters who are in college. So Tanya, Tanya do you want to uh, take it away and get us started? 
That would be great. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, can you can everybody see my screen? Okay, good. Yep. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you on a Wednesday night here in the States uh, at 8.15 p.m. I have a full house and I'm just telling everyone to please be quiet for the next hour. So we'll see if they actually are. Um, I saw some territory acknowledgements. Um, and so I'm going to briefly share mine. Um, so good morning to you all there. I'm Tanya Groves, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Education Network. The OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which Ash visited last summer, which was super fun. It's located on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land that was ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 51. I acknowledge this place has a very complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is just one of the ways in which we at the OEN work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. And we thank the Dakota people for their persistence through a violent history. If you haven't shared your land acknowledgement and you'd like to, please go ahead. Uh, while you all do that, I will just take you briefly through um, what I'm going to talk about as this little opening act uh, so that the big reveal with Ash and her awesome website, I can't wait to get to that. Um, but Ash asked me um, as a partner uh, with University of Southern Queensland to share a little bit about Open Education Network, um, briefly who I am. Um, what the OEN is and what we're about. Um, I'll share our action pathways um, and give you a snapshot, just a glimpse into OER adoptions, including our workshop strategy, the open textbook library, which some of you um, perhaps are familiar with, the certificate in OER librarianship, um, publishing and Pub 101, and then I'll end with um, kind of where we're headed, which is open educational practices. Um, so I think uh, you already shared potentially, Stephen, about the most important things, which really isn't all my degrees and stuff. It's my dogs. So I removed all that boring stuff uh, to put the pictures of my dogs, Ollie and Finney, and then because they're more uh, interesting to look at. But I started my career as an English teacher. I transitioned to college level teaching became an administrator, and it was in that role that I found open education, fell in love with it, believed in it. Um, I became acquainted with the Open Education Network, and four years later, I'm still thrilled by the fact that I get to work on projects and programs with people like Ash um, and Adrian Stagg, uh, people trying to make education more accessible, inclusive, and equitable every day. So, the Open Education Network um, is not a vendor. We are not a vendor. We're a diverse network of higher ed institutions working together to make higher education more affordable, equitable, and accessible. We represent over 1,500 member campuses across the United States, Canada, and Australia who strive to make higher ed more open. Specifically, Specifically, we're focused on action that advances open education in ways that are shareable and collaborative and sustainable. And we do this by sharing the experiences and expertise of our community in ways to support our members. So we really, as a community, are working together to help everyone in higher education. The best example of our efforts, I think, to support the common good is the Open Textbook Library which is a comprehensive library of open textbooks reviewed by faculty that make open textbooks freely available to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Um, and I think Ash is going to be sharing some links in the chat, so thank you for doing that. Ultimately, we are thinking of and trying to address something even bigger than open textbooks, and that is the advancement of educational equity through resources and practices that are more affordable, more accessible and more inclusive. So out of our strategic planning in 2021 came this idea of action pathways around OER adoptions, open pedagogy, revision and collection of OER and open textbook publishing. 
I'll just share some um, projects and snapshots of those pathways in the slides to come. These pathways directly come out of areas in which our members have expressed wanting more support. And so I want to equip you with some of the things that we have created because most everything we create is openly licensed because we want you to be using it in ways that are successful and helpful to your institution. So at the core of who we are and what we do is the truth that faculty still need to understand what OER, what open educational resources are and how they might go about using them. Um, I wish we could just take the awareness uh, raising for granted. And I, after being in this world for 10 years, I'm still like, we still have to talk about it, but we still have to talk about it. It's not ubiquitous. So our workshop strategy is still really foundational to what we do. So speaking of the workshop strategy, after lots of missteps and learning along the way, the founder of the Open Education Network, my boss, David Ernst, figured out that if you can get faculty to a workshop during which you make them aware of what open educational resources are, you help them to understand what open educational resources do and why the need for them is so pressing on many fronts. And you pay them, we figured out about $200, but everybody does it differently. You pay them to take the time to review an open textbook in the open textbook library. About 45% of them go on to actually adopt an open textbook. And that, that rate um, of adoption has stayed pretty consistent since about 2014. And Ash already shared the link, but with over 1,200 open textbooks in many different subject areas, the open textbook library is an ever-growing repertory or library of open textbook. And it's a great starting point for faculty to learn about open textbooks and to perhaps look for one for their own class. Next, I'd like to talk to you briefly about a program that I oversee, the Certificate in OER Librarianship. This is a comprehensive professional development program that offers formal training, a community of peers, and expert mentors in order to build sustainable, collaborative, and effective open education initiatives on higher education campuses. So started through funding from an Institute of Museum and Library Services grant, IMLS grant, this program is now in its fifth iteration, and it's been a really important part of our supporting really affordable, high quality professional development for the folks that we know are most often in roles of leadership of OER initiatives, librarians. So um, this particular link is a link to the public version of the certificate in OER librarianship curriculum and course. Um, and that's public and available to do with whatever you'd like. And it was very recently updated. Um, my friend and colleague, Karen Lawrenson, is the director of publishing for the OEN, the senior director, sorry. And she oversees Pub 101 which is a free online orientation to open textbook publishing for open ed members, open education network members. In synchronous sessions, participants talk about how to approach open textbook publishing in a variety of contexts with an emphasis on your well-being. Um, and however, so, so the synchronous sessions are um, an opportunity afforded to members. The curriculum is free and openly licensed so anyone can use it. So um, uh, that is a link that you can go ahead and check out if you're interested in, in delving into pub publishing, open textbook publishing a little bit more on your campus. Um, finally, while affordability will likely always be a concern, it seems as if attention here, at least in the states, has shifted slightly to open educational practices um, that center equity and student agency, practices like open pedagogy. So for the last several years, we've been hearing very consistently that they have wanted more resources about open pedagogy. How do we equip our faculty to understand and to be using these practices? So um, we created a certificate in open educational practices. Again, on a very generous grant from the IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, we've designed a year-long program to serve faculty and librarians. 
So we're, they're all paired as a team of two, one faculty and one librarian. Participants learn about the range of open educational practices in one semester in an asynchronous online class. Then they work together to create a personalized action plan that will allow them to transform curriculum through the power of open educational practices, including open pedagogy. We are just now finishing the first pilot. Um, and we are we applied for uh, uh, the second phase of the grant to allow more faculty librarian teams to go through this program for free. So we'll find out later this summer and we'll be um, definitely widely making this um, available to everybody. If you're interested, we will be sharing this curriculum out once we have a chance to look through the evaluations and revise it. But we knew that not everyone wants to be in a year long certificate program. We wanted a more abbreviated professional development option around open pedagogy. As a result, our um, fantastic fellow this year, Amanda Larson from the Ohio State University System has done a wonderful job creating an open pedagogy learning circle experience. So this was uh, took seven weeks. It was synchronous, one hour a week. Um, and we allowed 18 participants in faculty and um, faculty partners, librarians, instructional designers, administrators. The participants engaged in the learning circle to understand more about open pedagogy and to create a renewable assignment or a digital learning object about open pedagogy. Again, this is just wrapped up. It was a wonderful experience. Um, here's uh, at a glance what we we um, all the topics that we covered in the seven sections. Um, next week, Amanda Larson is uh, conducting a workshop on how to facilitate a faculty learning circle. I'm so sorry about what time it falls for you all. Really early in the morning, you probably don't want to get up that early. So I promise we will tape this. Uh, but Amanda's going to talk through, you know, why did we choose this learning circle? Why do we think learning circles work? Uh, why did we choose the topics we did? She's going to go over best practices, lessons learned, even share out some of the projects that the participants created, which were kind of mind blowing. In seven weeks, I didn't think I would be so impressed, but I'm like, I want to use that one and that one and that one. And they were openly licensed, so I can. So it was really an exciting experience. Um, we are sharing all the curriculum out um, freely, openly licensed and available. Um, and so Ash might have shared that link in the chat. Um, so with all of these opportunities that I'm talking about and the links that I'm sharing, um, I hope you hear from, from us uh, or, or from the OEN, from me, uh, train the trainer type of philosophy, because that has really underscored our strategy. The idea is to share all this out to equip librarians, instructional designers, and others who run OER initiatives in really doing the work of open education with all of the resources that we are freely giving um, to do with what you want on your own campuses. Um, in much the same way that Ash has done with this fabulous equity rubric um, and website um, that I'm excited to for you to all explore. It's really been a privilege to partner with Ash, Adrian Stagg, and others um, in Australia to extend the reach of open educational resources um, and to get our arms around how OER achieves educational equity. We are always interested in partnering in new and creative ways because we know we have lots to learn from you, and we know that the work of open education is a community effort. So thank you for inviting me. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ash for the real deal to see her uh, her fellowship final project, which is this wonderful website. Um, and my email is on the screen in case you have questions that you don't get to during this session. Feel free to, to reach out to me. I'm going to stop screen sharing here so that you can start. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to stop my screen share. Oh, okay, wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. That was a really amazing um, presentation and a great um, snapshot of what the OEN does. Um, 
Well, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Ash Barber, um, librarian at UniSA, um, and one of the co-conveners for the OEP SIG, um, for any of you who are new here. Um, so as Stephen and Tanya mentioned, Tanya and I kind of met through this group. Um, one of my co-conveners, Adrian, part of UniSQ and a member of the OEN network um, that Tanya's part of. So through some kind of like four degrees of open separation, Tanya and I met, <laughs> um, such as the power of the open community. We met while I was in Minneapolis um, during my fellowship trip and she showed me, I think she called it Midwestern hospitality, <laughs> essentially just being incredibly kind and generous with her deep knowledge of open education and all the work that the OEN does um, that we can learn from here in Australia, including some really great discussions around gathering student perspectives as evidence of the empowering impact of OER. Um, but before I continue into um, the heart of this presentation, I would like to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge the Ghana First Nations people and their elders past and present, who are the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which I live and work. And I also acknowledge the other First Nations of lands across Australia and the globe with which I interact, their elders, ancestors, cultures and heritage. So we're here for this chat or my section of this chat too, um, because the Libraries of the Australian Technology Network, Latin for short, very generously awarded a fellowship project for me to explore inclusive OER through a study tour of North America. So I've gone and done that. Um, and now I'm going to use today to show you the website I've created as a result. And some brief project background for anyone who hasn't seen my Open Access Week presentation from October last year. Um, I proposed this trip to address the, the problem of the confusion of theoretical resources available to help librarians understand the ins and outs of inclusive OER creation. There were lots of theoretical resources, some practical resources, and most covered a discrete aspect of the topic. Few were holistic. And if they were, then they weren't really contextualized to Australia. So I wanted to develop some kind of practical resource which would curate the content, pull together the bits for Australian librarians to use to identify the characteristics of OER that promote inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility. A resource that would in turn empower marginalised voices to speak and be heard, imbuing inclusive practices in education through the OER creation process. So with this lofty goal in mind, and in September last year, I visited several institutions across the US and Canada to learn more about how these practices are being successfully implemented over there. I came back with a giant spreadsheet, many more Twitter friends, and I've used this information, these tried and tested resources, methods, tools, and tips to put together the deliverable for the project, the empowered OER site. And so, here is the QR code in the website uh, link. It's empoweredoyar.com. Um, so if you would like to go there and have a look around um, while I'm also going to show it, um, you're more, more than welcome. So this is the live site. Um, and why is it green? Well, I like green. <laughs> um, and darker background colors tend to be kinder on the eyes. Um, green kind of seems synonymous with concepts of growth and creativity. And this is what the site will engage with. One of the key resources that I spoke about um, in my October presentation was the uh, branch ed equity rubric for OER evaluation. Um, if I go into explore, you'll be able to see um, a link to it here. And I talk a bit about it, I ooh and ah about it. <laughs> um, it received wide and resounding praise everywhere that I went on the trip and was exactly the kind of resource I was hoping to find. So, as it's CC licensed, thank you Branch Alliance. I've used it as a kind of framework upon which to build the site. Um, the rubric is a practical tool with a good research background, but the gap that we needed to fill in Australia was um, something that had those concrete examples of good practice, inclusive OER. The, the ones that ground the discussions in a plain and simple, here, this is what I mean, demonstration. So the Empowered OER website contextualizes the rubric by breaking down, uh, breaking it down into core sections and providing examples found in the wild, which demonstrate each equity concept. Um, and happily, this also provides the side benefit of showcasing some of the great work people are doing out there. Um, so the rubric is uh, 
uh, has four dimensions, learner-centered, critical, culturally sustaining, and universally designed for learning. Um, and within those dimensions are specific criteria to, to get down to that granular level to really find and analyze a resource and, and see how does this really meet these areas of equity. Um, so because the website runs the risk of just becoming yet another confusing resource in the sea of resources, I've created a couple of supplementary documents um, to, uh, to go with the site and a little section about how to use the rubric in the website. So um, just in this beginning bit, I talk about the rubric and show that you can use the rubric to evaluate something that you already have, that you can look at the overall equity in it, or you can look at certain areas of equity in that resource. And you can also use the rubric to fill an equity gap. So if you don't have a resource yet, but you know that there's something in your, in your course or in your materials that you're not really addressing well in terms of equity and inclusion, you can use the rubric and the website to find ways to fill that gap. Um, and so the supplementary documents on the site, they uh, give a, a demo scenario of how someone might use Empowered OER um, and also uh, a quick checklist that you can download that can serve as a bit of a reminder of the elements to look for without having to be mired deep within the website every time you want to evaluate something. Um, I'll show you what they are. So this is the, the kind of quick check document. It's a simple two page so that you can just print a single sheet of paper, double sided if you want to. It gives you a brief list of all of the criteria, space for notes to take as you, you know, as you're looking at your um, resource, and the uh, example scenario. I'm going to walk you through this one as a way of showing you around the site. So, if you imagine that you are an environmental science course instructor, um, so you're helping an environmental science course instructor, maybe you're a librarian, um, and you're helping them to assess their current open textbook against all areas of equity. Um, and so I've created a, a diagram down here to help us step through it. Um, and so you go through one by one each of these steps. You have a look at each um, criterion within each dimension one at a time, and you review the explanations and examples of those dimensions on the, on the Empowered OER site. So say, for example, we wanna look at the first dimension and the access criterion within that, we can go to the site, can scroll down, you can see we have the first dimension listed here, second dimension and scroll through and you get the others. So if we wanna look at access, I'll explain the, um, the anatomy of the page. So we've got you know, the heading access, a reminder that this is in dimension one learner-centered and then a reminder of what learner-centered encompasses um, and then we get into the meat of what access means in this context. Um, and I've used direct quotes from the equity rubric because they really agonized through many iterations of this rubric to really get those concepts down pat. So I didn't wanna change that. Um, so access, you know, provides multimodal access to the content. And they also suggest what you could look for in content that um, might point to this resource being an accessible resource. So they say, look for materials that can be accessed on multiple devices, materials that can be saved or printed as well as used in digital formats. And so then where Empowered OER comes in is with these key examples and suggestions. So I've collated lots of resources from the trip as well as from my own research and found um, examples that show these concepts in practice. So this one here, I'm talking about Nikki Anderson's book where she's um, uh, made it exportable in various formats and also given um, a definitions chapter that has the content available as both text and an infographic. So it's, you can access it in different um, media um, and so on. So that's how you could dive into one aspect of the rubric. So if we come back to the um, scenario. So you're looking through one criterion at a time. Um, you then note down any concrete examples of where this fictional textbook um, demonstrates each criterion, but also note where you're not able to identify anything. So that's where I've got, you know, not identified, not identified, um, because this approach will reveal those gaps. You can collect all of your not identifieds, 
and put them into this areas to improve section at the end so that you have this list of where you could improve this resource. But you can also find that it reveals where the resources strengths are. So for example, universal design for learning, this section, there was examples um, of each of these criteria within this fictional textbook. So it was really strong for universal design for learning, but maybe it could do some work um, on culturally sustaining critical and learner centered. Um, and if you're adapting or, or creating a resource, then maybe you can actually go into these areas and find out how you can better the resource for your needs. So maybe funds of knowledge, if we go back over here. Go into funds of knowledge. So you can have a look at this. So um, funds of knowledge, they leverage learners funds of knowledge um, and look for intentional opportunities for collaboration, which recognize the value in all participants contributions, activation of prior knowledge, for example, pre-assessment questions. Um, and again, I've got key examples and suggestions down here. So maybe we could um, adapt this textbook by adding in some of those pre-assessment questions to, um, to help enhance the funds of knowledge aspect of equity here. Um, and just as a reminder, I do have these little notes here that the thing that you're evaluating doesn't have to perfectly address every single criterion um, in the rubric to be valuable. It can still be really valuable if it, um, if it does really demonstrate one dimension. And maybe you're gonna supplement your course with other materials that that um, demonstrate the other dimensions, or maybe you were only looking for something to just fill a gap anyway. You can use this as a guide to get an overall sense of the, um, the resource. And bear in mind, it's, it's not a checklist. You don't want to start approaching it from a point of view of, oh, well, I've put a dot point in here, so then that's fine. It's not really that clear cut. It's just, a way to have some structure for your thinking to, um, to guide you through that process. Um, so back to the website. Um, the other sections on here, I've got a hot topic section. And really I made this page because I wanted to talk about chat GPT and I didn't know where to put it. <laughs> and so um, this is a, um, a page that um, just gives you some introductory information about ChatGPT in relation to open um, and some other sort of foundational stuff in there. Bear in mind, I wrote it about a month ago and we know that this is a very fast evolving topic. So it doesn't have the, the absolute latest in there at the moment, but it's a good place to start. Um, and I've also included definitions um, because to define the key terms around equity and open um, in relation to this site, because the site does assume some prior knowledge, so knowledge of what OER are um, and knowledge of basic sort of equity concepts. And so I've tried to help level the playing field there for anyone who comes to the site without that, they can have a look at that page to kind of get them started. Um, and more content will be added over time. Um, one of the things that I did learn though, over this the course of this whole project, is how long it can take to find a peer reviewer. It's really hard. And the site has been peer reviewed in part um, for various aspects, but it's been a really lengthy and difficult process to find um, peer reviewers with appropriate expertise and lived experience to assess the, um, the various aspects of the site. And um, so, that's why on every single page, there'll be a link to this contribute um, page. You'll see if we go into um, one of these, one of these sub pages right at the bottom, suggest an example that takes you into contribute. Because um, as I've said here, the resource hub exists through collaboration. So I want to encourage anybody who would like to submit feedback um, on anything that maybe isn't working or things that are working that you want more of, or if you have suggested resources that really exemplify different areas of um, the equity rubric really well, please let me know. Um, Aussie examples were really hard to find, but they are scarce because that's what they cited for <laughs> to cre help create more Aussie examples. Um, and 
certainly um, over the last year, many more examples um, are cropping up with the um, Call OER Collective and um, you know, other community groups um, really making waves over the last year. Um, and so the, the website really is kind of like practice-led research where you can't really know what to do until you're doing it. Um, it's that iterative process where the needs are defined and the solutions become crystallized through that um, practice. So the website is the first complete version of itself. It's Empowered OER 1.0, um, <laughs> period in part. And um, I can already see that I think future iterations or versions, they might reduce or combine some of the um, equity criteria as there are some really strong overlaps, but I wanted to try it out as it is first um, and then have it be informed by use or practice. Um, and I do wanna turn now to some of the bonus features of the fellowship. Um, that is the unexpected additional outcomes um, aside from the actual deliverable itself, the website. Um, so like going over to North America to have these conversations in person or at least on the same time zone led to many incidental meetings where another colleague would tag along or um, I was at a meeting with someone at the same time that they had a regional OER librarians meeting. So I got to meet a whole bunch of other librarians at the same time just by happenstance. Um, and it also helped to build that trust so that people felt more comfortable talking to me about some of the less great experiences they've had um, as they're connecting with a real life human, not a face on a screen. Although I appreciate that everyone here is doing that right now. So thank you. Um, the fellowship has also grown into further opportunities, not just for me, but for um, my university, UniSA, and the various communities of practice um, that I interact with in Australia had the cool opportunity to peer review the work of an esteemed colleague, multi-award winning Nikki Anderson. Um, that was the Enhancing Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Accessibility in OER book that I uh, had on screen a moment ago. Uh, I actually became so familiar with the text that I did refer to it a few times in the website because it exemplifies various aspects of equity really well. Um, so that was a really nice confluence. Um, I was also invited to run a couple of workshops on finding OER last year as a guest speaker for the Call OER Professional Development Program. Um, and I ran some similar sessions with my own colleagues at UniSA as well. And I've kept in touch with many of the wonderful people I met on the trip. Tanya presenting with me today is a perfect example, despite it being almost nine o'clock at night for her today. So let's all appreciate Tanya. Um, and um, apparently I just can't seem to stop. As I wrote, um, a post for the Call Digital Dexterity blog, which was pub, uh, published a week ago, and have another project underway that I'm hoping to talk more about later in the year. So to round out this presentation, I would like to give my truly heartfelt thanks to all of the people who have contributed to this project and a thanks in advance to all those who will continue to contribute by using the contribute button on the website. <laughs> um, and this is my nice segue back to um, the link and QR code for my site, um, and then also my contact details. Um, when I gave my last talk about this project in October, I closed by suggesting we examine our why, to use that question of social justice as our meaningful anchor when lost in um, or, or flooded with overwhelming confusion in this topic. But I think this time, it's been six or seven months since I gave that talk and we're about a year and a bit into a nationwide collective for OER creation with another round of grants just landing this last month after several more publications going live. So I think we've got our why down pat and the momentum of creation is delivering results. So this time I'd like to close by saying, let's examine that. Let's take a leaf from Tanya's book and gather evidence from our students, our academics, our instructors to examine the impact of those results that are beginning to filter through and use that as our fuel for this next stage. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you, Ash. Um, amazing stuff. And you've both covered a lot of ground. So I'm sure there's probably quite a lot of questions. Um, Oh, there's some participants here from Los Angeles. Cool. So time for questions. So feel free to either chuck it by text into the chat or just uh, unmute yourself and we'd love to hear your voices. 
Actually, we could start with James's question, and it's to Ash. Um, he's curious to know what you recommend, if anything, about accessibility or inclusive, inclusivity in relation to different file formats, PNG versus JPEG, SVG, DOCX, PDF, HTML, all that kind of stuff. Any insights, Ash? Um, so recommendations for the accessibility, inclusivity um, in relation to different file formats. Well, I'm not an expert on file formats, um, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't want to um, lead you astray, but I think the probably the first thing I would do is look at um, places like the WCAG guidelines um, for like the web content accessibility guidelines, have a look at what the standards are. Um, that's probably a pretty good spot to look. Also, um, have a look at Nikki Anderson's book. <laughs> Her book really does cover a lot of that kind of, um, that sort of thing, yeah. I can see a question for Tanya in the chat, actually, um, from Richard. So, uh, Tanya, how do you get around the challenge um, acad academic authors, oh, it's disappearing, the challenge of academic authors around copy editing, design, and professional uh, look, and feel that they may feel commercial publishers um, help them with, and they don't have the time or resources to work out? I didn't read that very well, my apologies. Yeah, I w um, you know, it's been a while since I've presented to a group of faculty that were pushing back that kind of ended um, the pandemic kind of ended our face to face um, workshops, which was kind of sad. But uh, my boss was always really good about saying, um, you know, we aren't trying to convince anyone. We're just saying, here's an option. Consider it. Um, that kind of optimism and refusal to engage in anything confrontational always just kind of stripped people of it. So, oh, you know, you like what you're doing? Good. If it works for your students, great. Um, and so I took a page out of Dave Ernst's book and, and started trying to react in that same manner. Um, but, I, you know, I also used to, back in the day, pre-pandemic, take a an open textbook um you know with me that had been published because not always you can't generalize right but many of the open textbooks look just like uh one that had gone through you know uh, the proprietary publishing process so it's not like we're down in our basements you know running it off in a copier machine um <clears throat> but i i don't i don't feel like once i kind of saw that modeling i didn't spend a whole bunch of time trying to convince those folks. I was like, oh, oh, good. You're, you're happy. Go for it then. Um, and instead, I would work, you know, with a handful of faculty who followed me and waited in line to talk because they were the ones on board. So, you know, what I'm saying is it's okay to work with those who seem on board and to let those who aren't not you know be where they are respect where they are um so at least that's that's how i've dealt with it um and then just the the reality that there are many open textbooks that are published peer-reviewed copy edited on all of that um and i think pub 101 and and um that curriculum helps to address some of those issues because it answers them and points to some resources if your institution doesn't have all of that at the ready which the institution institution I came from before this certainly did not. So there are resources like Pub 101 and other resources that can help you through that. There's a question from Karen about uh, capturing any usage of the tools you've created to basically have they made a difference and how, how can we know? I think that may be in relation to Tanya's tools, but maybe Ash, you could think about the future too in relation to empowered OER. Um, yeah, uh, I have thought about it, <laughs> but, um, I don't have, um, and I don't have the answer at the moment, really. Um, that's, I guess the next step for the website. Um, it's, 
now that it's actually up and live, I can see um, like it's it's powered by WordPress. So um, WordPress gives a lot of cool analytics. Um, and so they, they send me this really nice little like hooray, like fireworks thing um, when uh, I get a certain number of new subscribers and things, which is quite fun. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I can see things like how many people are viewing the pages, which pages they're viewing, um, where they've been referred from. So did they find it through Twitter or directly through, um, you know, using the link or through Google or something like that. I can also see where they're coming in from. So, um, you know, if it is having an impact in Australia, which hopefully <laughs> that's the point. Um, so yeah, WordPress itself has a lot of built-in stuff, which is great. Um, but definitely that's something to, um, that I need to think about going further, um, going forward, yeah. How about you, Tanya? I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a more intelligent answer than Ash, uh, did. Um, and I, I will just say that um, this website goes beyond the rubrics that I have used as I'm looking at re open educational resources through that equity lens. Um, and so I think this resource is going to be, your, your website is going to be incredibly helpful. And I also appreciate, um, I know that Nick, is it, I'm sorry, your friend's book, um, Nikki Anderson's book is also wonderful. It's a book I've been meaning to look at in the Open Textbook Library, and um, it looks like an incredibly helpful resource. So it just, for me, it's heartening that there are more and more resources that are specifically analyzing how inclusive is this, how equitable is it, is it, you know, utilizing UDL, all of these different um, dimensions. So there, the fact that there is a proliferation um, of publishing about these things means that we're paying attention to it. Um, but I'm sorry, I, I I don't, you know, as far as whether it meets all four dimensions, uh, I can't speak to that, unfortunately. Uh, yes, Ash, did you want to <clears throat> address this one to you about the dimensions? Is it is it rare to find curriculum resources that address all four dimensions, or is it more common for a resource to be strong across maybe only one or two? Um, I can't tell you for sure. Like I don't have any sort of, um, you know, statistical information on it. But um, I, just in my, I guess, personal experience, um, it's more common to find something that's strong across one or two dimensions than across all. Um, and I think that's just because we don't all know all the things. And we have that natural bias towards our own experience and um, without concerted effort to look at how something is impacting someone else it's um, you know it doesn't naturally happen so uh, yeah I would say it's quite rare to find something that addresses everything and yet another one for you Ash rapid fire stuff uh, how about learning designers um, MISE is curious about how it can be used to engage academics in enhancing their teaching practices. So are there any insights or examples of how learning designers or similar staff can use the rubric to uh, yeah, build meaningful collaborations with academics? Um, well, one of the people who has had a look at the website and um, done a, a kind of peer review of it, um, it was a learning strategist consultant. Um, and uh, she particularly had, a, that's Carolee Klein, Dr. Carolee Klein, she um, particularly looked at the universal design for learning section, that is her area of expertise. And um, so that that is a concept that has really come from that learning design realm. Um, so that could be a way into those conversations um, with, with academics if they're more familiar with those sorts of concepts already, you can kind of start there and then slowly feed them into the rest of the site and um, the other aspects of the rubric. Um, does that, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Ash. And I can see a lot of uh, UDL similarities and intersection with the way you put the rubric. So it's, it's a great resource. And I was also particularly interested in um, that conversation we, which we try to attempt with academics, particularly on, yeah. hey, I hope you thought of what it means for your content to be shared openly. 
So yeah. coming from that perspective and trying to have that conversation with academics is actually really challenging. So yeah. I'm really glad that you yeah. built on the UDL in that way, which is really a great, um, great way. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad that it's, um, you're already seeing some ways that it can apply. James has got a question. How about, uh, are there any, uh, I think this is for both of you, Tanya and Ash, are there any best practice examples curated out there, um, particularly by discipline with some sort of inclusivity rubric reviews? I don't know. Um, be great if there are. <laughs> um, I think one of the, the problems that we run into when we start to try and curate things by discipline is then where is the line to put something into one or the other sometimes? That line, that line can be a little blurry and I think that's why we don't see it too often, um, especially being maintained you know you might find a curation and then it kind of has left a, a couple of years in the dust um so you know if if that's something that you're passionate about then by all means i i would encourage you to um to share what you find um and you know we can see what we can include in the website or elsewhere where it might be more appropriate to put it um there are um you know obviously many many referentries like Open Textbook Library that curate things by discipline. And then you can perhaps see through that if areas of equity have been flagged as well. Like I know that on Pressbooks, you can look for like indigenous voices. Um, that's one of the categories you can specifically filter to. So um, I think it's more around filters that are available right now rather than specific curations. Yeah. One feature of the open textbook library <clears throat> structure that I really like is the, um, I guess you could call it peer review, uh, the, the kind of starring system. It's almost like that Amazon review type of system, perhaps a lot less malicious. Uh, and it has, you know, several categories that um, peers can rate a textbook out of five. And I think at least one or two of those categories are based on um, inclusiveness and uh, this sort of stuff. So that, that's one area to look out for. Also, um, the, the OEP SIG um, only just this week was talking about getting a group together to put together some kind of um, collection of case studies um, that uh, of the impact of OER or where, um, where open educational practice is making an impact. So um, that's potentially something that can come out of that work as well. And if you are a person who has any great examples of case studies or has any experiences that you think could be worth contributing to some collective knowledge space, then um, get in touch with us to, to talk about that as well. I think we can sneak in one quick line. Uh, Tanya, did you want to? Well, I was just going to say that it doesn't exactly meet the questions parameters, but we will be launching um, an open uh, pedagogy portal um, that will be organized by discipline. And we are going to have some type of inclusivity uh, standards there. But basically, it's so that you know, open pedagogy is kind of a squishy topic. Um, and so it's someone in English literature can go and look at an open pedagogy uh, case study with work with student work product to go, oh, I could do that in my class. Um, and so we are working on it right now and we'll likely launch it this summer. Um, and so just in, in kind of the spectrum of all we're talking about, it's one more resource that will be um, kept up to date by the Open Education Network. So be on the lookout for that. Awesome. Well, keep an eye out for that. Um, sadly, we are out of time. But um, once again, thank you so much, Tanya and Ash, for your awesome presentations and resources and links. So if everyone can put your hands together as much as you can on Zoom and thank our two speakers. The recordings will be available from early next week on our YouTube channel. 
And um, oh, announcement, quick announcement about the next webinar. It's on June the 13th and it'll be on the untapped power of wikis like uh, Wikipedia, Wiki University wikiversity and such tools for learning and teaching so i'm going to paste the registration link into the chat i literally just created it <laughs> um and yeah we'll have several university of canberra speakers at that including james who was in this webinar today so see you all then and um yeah thanks for coming <laughs>